I was going to say, if you need to move over, I get my that mic stand there. But.
How are we doing? Good. All right. It's good to see everyone in worship this morning in our 1045 worship service. I'd like to say a welcome to our online visitors as well who are viewing us on YouTube today. And as I speak this welcome and you see the choir getting into place, I want you to be invited to next week's special Sunday of worship when we will have the Advent musical celebration at both worship services, 815 and 1045, featuring this choir before you, as well as our children's choir and our Campbell Ringers bell choir and soloists and other special things that are happening next Sunday. So be sure to not only come yourselves, but invite family, invite friends. It's going to be a special worship experience. And now let's experience a part of that with a little bit of a tease, shall we say, of next week's Advent musical celebration. is the power
Last week, we lit the first candle of Advent, the candle of hope. Today, we light the candle of peace and the candle of hope. During this, our Advent journey, we are on the way to where God would have us be, but we are not there yet. How shall we go? We shall go together as one body, living and trusting in one another. We shall go as this community of faith, working side by side, and leaning into the grace of God every step of the way. We shall go in peace. We are not alone on this journey. Today, especially, we join our hearts with our new community of friends living in Monte Cristo, Nicaragua. We thank God for the blessing of partnership to work together with them, trusting God to lift them out of poverty. Today, we ask God to fill their hearts with God's peace. Isaiah says that in the days to come, the nations shall stream to the mountain of the Lord, and there we will beat swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. There we will learn war no more. God will teach us peace. Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord so that God may teach us the ways of peace. We light our first candle, remembering the promised, the hoped for Messiah. Hope breaks into the world. As we light this candle of peace, we remember gratefully the promises we find in God's word. The prophet Isaiah called Christ the Prince of Peace. Angels proclaimed peace on earth when baby Jesus was born. Jesus assured his disciples, saying, Peace I live with you, leave with you, my peace I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Please pray with me. Gracious God, we thank you for the gift of peace that is found in Christ Jesus. Fill us with your peace and use us to speak your peace into the world. God of hope, God of peace, shine into our hearts. Amen. Thank you, Tessa. I would ask everyone to please rise as you're able as we join in our opening song of worship together, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Once gave the law 
hidden cloud and majesty and all. Oh, rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel. Shall come to thee, O Israel. seated. Good morning. Good morning. I, lo I love that song. I get a big smile on my face when we sing Rejoice. Mm -hmm. Rejoice. Anyway, uh, good morning. I'm here to talk about Rainbow Network again. As you know, we're now in our Advent season where we ask for above and beyond giving. Uh, during this time to support our community in Rainbow Network's uh, system. that Monte Cristo is the name of our community. Uh, so today I wanted to um, it spotlight the education uh, there. Uh, Rainbow Network believes that education is the key to breaking the cycle of poverty. Uh, Rainbow Network nationwide supports 10,500 students and what they do for these students, see the government only provides an elementary education for free for the children. If they want to go to high school, that costs money. Um, so part of what Rainbow Network does is they organize the communities uh, and have afternoon school for the elementary children. They call those collectivos. And in Monte Cristo, our, our community, it has, they have two collectivos that have 43 children in each collectivo. And in that, they support the uh, core classes that they have in the morning, and they also have a nutritious meal for the children while they're there. And then the high school students who do get um, sponsored by people just like you all, um, as part of their paying back, uh, or paying forward, maybe is the better word for it. Uh, they help run the collectivos. They can also volunteer at the health clinics that occur in their community. Um, for the scholarship program, uh, we already have several members here who sponsor a student. Uh, and Monte Cristo currently has 10 high school students who are being sponsored. I found out this week that there are three students available and waiting for a sponsor. And I have information about sponsoring a student out on a table in the fellowship hall if you want to see me after church and would be interested in sponsoring one of those students. The sponsorship costs $30 a month or $360 a year. And uh, it provides them uniforms and school supplies and sometimes transportation costs, whatever's needed to help those students go to high school. Uh, they also work on getting technical degrees um, now through Rainbow Network. Youth and adults can earn a technical degree and are encouraged to start a business with the skills they learn there. Uh, in Monte Cristo, some of the scholarship students are taking technical courses that include making organic fertilizer and cultivation techniques for the farming that happens in that area. The new skills acquired through these courses help the students to bring in their own incomes and help support their families. In the 
other weeks where we've shown some pictures, you might have noticed a picture of a young man wearing a white sash. Uh, his name is Darwin. He's a student in Monte Cristo who's 15 and is in his third year of high school. He's a hardworking student and take his, takes advantage of every opportunity to acquire new knowledge. He is currently taking a course in English, and he has also completed a field technician course through the technical school, and he volunteers at one of the collectivos for the primary school children. He wants to study system engineering in the future. Darwin has been recognized as one of the top students in his area due to his excellent grades, so that is the photo you, you might have seen in a previous week. Uh, the sash indicated that he was a top student in their area. So I just want to encourage you all um, to give what you can during this season so we can keep all the good work they're doing in Nicaragua going and to support our community in Monte Cristo. Thank you very much. Hello, my little angel. Well, still not you. <laughs> Good morning. Hi, guys. Come on, precious. Hurry up. Yay. Thanks for coming down. Pick a seat. Have a seat. Everybody gets to have a seat. Good morning. Pretty hair. Hey, guys. How are you? Good. Did everybody do Thanksgiving? Yeah. Oh, I don't know that my belly could do it twice, to be <laughs> honest with you. I, I tried. Oh. Uh, I think that's the best way to do it. Yeah, spread it out a little bit. Oh, mercy. Well, you call me when you have the third one, okay? <laughs> okay. We're going to talk about a word today I think you all know. And the word is peace. Have you heard that word before? Has anybody heard that word before? I've heard, of course. What do you think peace means? Can you clear? You know? Come on, Don, what's it mean? Quiet. <laughs> what do you think, Kay? It, yeah, that's a good one. Contentment. It's really hard this time of year to think about peace, isn't it? Are your mom and dads kind of running crazy, doing crazy things, putting up Christmas trees and Christmas lights, and, and we got to go to church, and we got to go over here and eat, and we got to go there and eat, and we got to get these presents, and then there's birthdays. Everybody's kind of crazy, right? Okay, fine. Yeah, good for you. We came to service, right? <laughs> so I want to think about something um, with your families because it's kind of crazy this time of year because everybody's waiting on what? Christmas. In 21 days. <laughs> good job, Tom. Because Christmas gets exciting, doesn't it? It gets exciting, and everybody's running around crazy. But we have to remember Christmas is not just about presents, right? It's about the birth of Jesus, right? And so we're so grateful for that. And so while we're thinking, I think peace means no fighting. Oh, what about that? No fighting. It's not impossible. It's a little improbable, but it's not impossible, right? Right? So maybe as kiddos, because I'm kind of a kid at heart, you know that, we can try to do our best to make peace with our brothers and sisters. Yeah, do a treaty. Good job, dude. Do a treaty. Be sure and date that thing. <laughs> and we could help our friends, help people at school if somebody's having some trouble, so that we can just be calm and peaceful. It's a tough time of year. Everybody's going crazy. 
I'm going to tell you, you guys don't drive yet. There are a lot of people in Springfield that don't know how to drive. So <laughs> we should pray for those people because it's really honest and you're in that car. We have three visitors this morning. Did you guys see? Say hi. We're glad you're here. You came to see us. Yay. <laughs> it's so exciting when people come to visit. Good morning, Ash. <laughs> okay, so I want you to think about peace. Think about peace in your life and what you can do to be peaceful. Instead of running crazy and saying, Mom, 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 where's my shoe? Where's my shoe? Where's my books? What did I do with them? Think, okay, let me think. Where did I last have that shoe? Or where did I leave that toy, okay? Let's try to find peace in our hearts so that we can spread that around and everybody can have peace. Does that sound like a plan? Sounds like a plan to me. Can we pray? Everybody pray. Dear Jesus, we come to you today and we are so grateful, Father. We're so grateful for your love and your protection that you provide us. We're glad, Lord, that these children can come to a place where they learn about you and they understand you and where they can talk to others and help others understand you. We ask these things in your precious name. Amen. Mm -hmm. Okay? Good time. Yeah. Yay! Go practice. Well, we're very thankful for Debbie and her wonderful message for the children this morning and for all of us. Uh, ways that we can definitely carry peace out into the world and share that. Uh, we've come to the time in our worship service this morning where we are going to go to God in prayer. So you will see the names of some of the people in our church family who have asked us to uh, lift them up and entrust their cares and their concerns to God on, on their behalf. And so we are, are it's our privilege to do that this morning and also to remember them through throughout the week and know that God is is with them and knows exactly what is going on. Also, uh, no, no doubt that you have joys and concerns in, in your own hearts this morning. And so there will be a quiet time during the prayer where you can lift those up to God. You can either just speak them in your heart or you're welcome to speak them out loud if you want. This is a safe and loving church family. So we are all here together to... Um, support and pray and love one another. Know also that you are invited to come and kneel at the chancel rail if you so desire uh, during the prayer. Before we go to God in prayer, though, we are thankful that we can go to God in song. Blessed be the Lord of Israel Who came to set us free God is faithful to raise up for us A Savior just for you and me Prophets whispered of the promise, a time of hope foretold. God would save us from our enemies and grudge his heart and
please pray with me. Gracious and wise God, pour out your spirit of wisdom to rest upon us, a spirit of understanding and knowledge. Grant us to live in peace and let your mercy and peace prevail. Faithful God, strengthen us with your steadfastness. May peace prevail like lamb and wolf. Grant us to live in harmony. Let your mercy and peace prevail. Compassionate God, open our hearts to voices crying out in the wilderness, people living in fear, those wandering alone, those distressed by uncertainty. Grant all a place of harmony. Let your mercy and peace prevail. Forgiving God, reveal to us our own actions and words and stir our hearts to repent of any harm done. Where there is abuse and hurt, bring relief, peace, and healing. Bear the spirit of harmony and let your mercy and peace prevail. Generous God of hope, joy, and peace, please fill all hearts with the hope of your promise and light of your love so that we with one voice glorify and praise you. God, prepare the way and let your mercy and peace prevail. <clears throat> Healing and comforting God, we entrust to your tender care those whose names appear on our prayer list. You know their situation better than we do. Please touch their lives with your healing and reassuring presence. We also bring to you joys and concerns that are on our minds and in our hearts. And so in these quiet moments now, we entrust those to you as we either speak them in our hearts or audibly voice them within this safe community of faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now, wise teacher and listening God, we offer to you the prayer your son Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. It is so good to see you here this morning. Welcome to the uh, the 1045 worship service here at Campbell United Methodist Church. Uh, it is it is a uh, a sight that gives me joy to uh, to see each of you here today. Uh, in fact, I, I would like to have a moment of affirmation for for all of us here. We didn't get to do it earlier because there's a lot going on. But here's what I'd like you to do. Find somebody near you that you're not sitting with currently and tell them it's totally awesome that you're here. Can you do that for me, please? So just find someone, please. Okay. Thank you, and you too. You too, Nikki. It's totally awesome that you're here. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. It is awesome that you are here. We give thanks to God for you, especially if you are a guest with us today. Uh, if you are a guest, uh, it's just like the 
best thing since sliced bread that you're here this morning, and uh, we give thanks to the Lord for you. Uh, I want to thank uh, the Lord for others who've been helping out with our worship service this morning. We're grateful for Tessa uh, lighting the uh, uh, the Advent wreath. We're grateful for Joy who gave our, our mission uh, moment, our choir, our, our our band. You're going to be hearing some some wonderful music uh, later on from Sarah. Debbie gave a great children's message, and on and on. We're we're grateful to God for each of them and grateful to God for each of you. Uh, I haven't introduced myself. My name is Daniel, and uh, I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm, uh, I'm thankful for that, and I'm thankful for you. Today, we are continuing uh, this series called Campbell at the Movies, Christmas Edition, and uh, it's a series that we started uh, last week. Pastor Rachel uh, kindly began the sermon as I was out of town last week. The week before that, I was sick. Pastor Rachel also preached at the last minute. Many thanks to God for Pastor Rachel as well. She's, she's awesome. Um, and the idea behind this series is that we are considering different Christmas-themed movies each week and just asking ourselves what they might have to teach us or not about trying to follow Jesus today. Today, we're going to be considering uh, this a classic Christmas movie, The Polar Express. We'll be getting to that in just a moment. But before we do, I'd like to ask if you would to please pray with me. Let's pray. Oh God, I give you thanks for each person in this room. You know, O oh Lord, that there are many paths that have brought us to this place and this moment together. Some of us come to this hour, O oh Lord, that's filled with hope and anticipation and ready and eager for this new season of uh, new beginnings in you. Others of us, perhaps, O oh Lord, come to this hour with uh, worry or, or fear or, or anxiety or, or just not sure exactly how to feel. Whatever we bring to this hour, O oh Lord, it is holy, and it is a gift that we offer up to you. And we pray that you would be present in these moments together to draw us closer to you and to Christ and to each other. We pray through your Holy Spirit. Amen. So go ahead and um, raise your hands. How many of you have seen the Polar Express, watched the Polar Express? Yeah, I'd say probably most of us. Yeah, thank you. If we haven't, that's totally okay. I'm going to kind of fill you in. Uh, the movie came out, can you believe it, almost 20 years ago, in 2004, so it's 18 years old now, uh, almost 19 years old. At the time that it came out, it received a lot of attention, and rightly so. It was the most expensive animated film ever made at the time that it came out, up until that point. It was also the very first uh, film to uh, be uh, produced entirely using uh, digital motion capture technology. You, you know that, that stuff where the actors wear the the jumpsuits and the pinball or the uh, ping pong balls on their on their uh, on their outfits, and they act in front of green screens, and the computer captures that and translates it into a computer animation. It was the first film filmed entirely that way. It received um, a lot of nominations for awards, and so rightly so, it got a lot of praise, and it has received a lot of praise uh, in the years between 2004 and now. But it's also received a fair amount of of critique as well. And a lot of the critique surrounding Polar Express has to do with this concept known as the Uncanny Valley. How many of you have heard of the Uncanny Valley? One, two, three. Okay, good, 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 good. I'm glad some of us have. Uh, don't tell the 815 service you had them beat on that. That was, uh, it was you're, you're, no one knew that in the 815 service, but, uh, but most of us don't, and that's okay, because uh, that means I get to tell you about this concept which I find really, really fascinating, and I hope that you do too. Here's the idea behind the Uncanny Valley. Um, it's this idea in art and design that, that the harder you work to make something look human, the better and better it's going to be, the more and more attractive it's going to be to us, the more and more positive we're going to feel about this thing that you're trying to make human, until, until you get to the point where it's just on the edge of looking perfectly human, and then all of a sudden it gets really creepy, right? You get the idea behind that? So, so the idea behind the Uncanny Valley is our, our level of attraction and positiveness to something that people are working hard to make human goes up and up and up and up. We feel better and better and better about it until it's just about looking perfectly human, and then it gets awkward, right? So think about it like this, like a, like a smiley face, right? A smiley face. Uh, it, we know it's not human. We can tell that by looking at it. But it's cute, right? So we like a smiley face. It's got the two dots, 
and the smile, and, and so that's kind of going up the graph, right? We, we, we feel positive about that. We feel good about that. Then it gets to, uh, I don't know, like uh, anime cartoons, right? Anime cartoons. We know they're not human, but they look cute and we like them, and that's kind of cool, right? Then we get to maybe robots, right? C-3PO, Star Wars, walking around. We know they're not human, but they look kind of human, and they're kind of cute and adorable, and we like it like that. But then, then we get to, oh, I don't know, highly realistic ventriloquist dummies, right? Or mannequins in a store that look just like humans, and then it's suddenly very awkward, right? And we feel kind of weird about it. It's called the uncanny valley. And it's this illustration uh, of an idea that sometimes the harder we work to achieve something, in the end it gets us all the further away from the desired results, right? The harder we work toward getting something, sometimes the further we get from the desired results. And that's a critique that's been made about uh, uh, the Polar Express sometimes, that they've worked so hard to make the, the characters in this animation look human that, uh, that some people find it kind of creepy, right? Some people kind of find it creepy. The idea behind the Uncanny Valley is this, this notion that, that sometimes the harder we work to try to achieve something, the farther it actually gets us away from what we're trying to do. And I think the same could be said with faith, too, right? That, that sometimes, sometimes the harder we work at trying to have the perfect faith, the more we work at trying to have, you know, a, just the, a heart full of faith and a mind full of faith, and we tell ourselves this is what we got to believe, the harder it is to actually get there, right? And the further we feel like we really have faith at all. And that is probably one critique I have of the Polar Express movie. I don't mind the Uncanny Valley so much. You know me if you've been here before well enough to know now that I really I kind of I kind of dig awkward stuff right awkward stuff is kind of my jam I kind of like it right but um, but my critique of it probably does have to do with with how faith is presented in some ways in the movie um, here's a here's a synopsis of the movie if you haven't seen it it centers around this boy who who really 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 wants to believe in Santa Claus right and 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 he and he works so hard to believe in Santa Claus but the truth is he's got some he's got some doubts. Right? He's not sure. And, and so he works really hard to overcome those doubts. And throughout the movie, the closer he gets to this perfect belief in Santa Claus, the better things are. Right, You can hear the bells of Christmas. Santa Claus shows up, all the magic, all that stuff. And the more doubts he has, the more he feels like he's really a terrible human being. Right? In fact, there's this creepy scene in the, in the movie where he's in this, this room filled with toys and with puppets. And, and they say to him, you're a doubter, right? We know you. You're a doubter, right? You've got doubts. And it's, it's terrifying, right? It's terrifying because he feels like he's not a good person. And I think, pardon me, I'm, I'm, uh, I haven't preached in a couple weeks. <coughs> Did you like did you like how I hopped into my microphone right at that yeah. so. Sometimes that's the image that we get of faith, too. Can you hear me? Okay. Sometimes the idea that the church has given us a faith over the years is a very similar uh, image, this idea that, that we have to have uh, faith that is strong enough and power enough, powerful enough and, and intense enough uh, to get in good with God, right? And if we have that kind of super strong faith, then all is good. God loves us. Everything's roses. If we have any doubts, we're in trouble, right? Have you kind of encountered this before? Um, for me, that, that has, it does some, some mind games. For me, I, I think about it sometimes like this. Let's say that maybe on a scale of 0 to 10 on faith, maybe at my best day, when I'm at my best, I don't know. Let's say maybe I'm a 6.2, right? A 6.2 maybe on a scale of 0 to 10. 
And maybe I feel good about that, right? But, but then I start to worry, right? What if I feel good on the scale of 0 to 10 if I've got a 6.2 faith, but God is like, you got to have a 7.8 or something like that, right, for, for faith. And all of a sudden, I start to worry. What if my 6.2 level of faith isn't good enough? Now I've got doubts. I'm knocked down to a 5, right? Now I've got some more doubts. I'm knocked down to a 4. And all of a sudden, I'm worried that I don't have strong enough faith for God to, to, to love me, for Jesus to save me, for me to go to heaven, however you want to talk about the end game of faith, right? And there are a couple of problems with that. I don't know if that vibe kind of resonates with you or not, but there are a couple of problems with that. The first is it, it turns faith into just one more thing that we have to do to earn God's love, right? Right? It, it, it's, it's putting the ball in our court again. It's not about how God loves us. It's about what can we do to make God love us, right? And, and so it, it's kind of the, um, the whole problem of, of works righteousness all over again. Uh, that's a term that we think about, especially 500 years ago with the Reformation. 500 years ago, there was this big argument in the church about we've got to do these good things in order for get God to get God to love us, right? And the Reformation happened, and the Reformers said, no, nah, no, nah, it's not about trying to earn God's love by the good things we do. We just trust that God loves you, which sounds good. But then over the last 500 years, we've turned that faith again into something we have to do in order to get God to love us, right? In order to get God to care for us. And then the other problem with that is that's really not the, the biblical picture of faith we get anyway. Some of you have heard me talk about this before, but um, uh, the word for faith in the, in the Bible, especially in the Gospels, is uh, it's this Greek word. It's, it's pistis, P-I-S, P-I-S. And, and pistis can be translated as faith. This is the word Jesus uses when he talks about faith. But it can also equally be translated as belief and as trust. And for me, over the last many years of my life, that trust has really become my preferred translation of that word. Right? Not that faith is bad, not that belief is bad, but it's just gotten a lot of baggage, those terms. Right? When we talk about faith and belief now, we, we, we almost immediately go to this thing where we think it's, it's the thoughts we think. Right? That faith is about thinking the right thoughts, that, that we have to get our minds in 100% alignment with some sort of uh, statement of belief that the church says we need to, to have. And if we can get our minds in 100% alignment with that, then we're good, right? Faith has gotten this, this notion of being the thoughts we think. The trust, which again is an equally valid translation of this word, trust is, is less about the thoughts we think and more about heart stuff, right? It's more about learning to rely on another human being, right? On another person. It's, it's learning that we can rely on someone else. It's not about the thoughts we think. It's about the relationships that we can rely on in our hearts. Right? And isn't that what Christianity is all about, ultimately, isn't it? It's not about getting us to think the right thoughts about Jesus. It's about learning in our hearts that we can rely in relationship to Jesus, God. And that's the picture of faith we really get in the Bible. Uh, not a, a, a thoughts we think kind of faith, but, a, but a, a trust and relationship kind of faith. For example, our scripture reading for today. Our scripture reading for today is Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. Now this is written at a time when the people of God, the Israelites, are really feeling quite hopeless. They're feeling cut off from God. They feel cut off from their glory days. Their glory days for the Israelites were were uh, symbolized by King David, who was their, their favorite king, and he's long gone by the time we get to Isaiah 11. And, uh, and King David's father was Jesse, by the way, and so when you hear Jesse it mentioned in this passage, it's just another way of, of kind of metaphorically hearkening back to the glory days, when everything was good, they said. But now they've come to this place in life, the Israelites believe, when they, there's, there's no king they can rely on, there's nothing they can rely on, no institution they can rely on. If you've ever felt like you've come to a place in life when the things you used to rely on, you feel you can't rely on anymore. That's, that's where the people are. And then Isaiah comes and offers this message. I'm grateful to God for Elizabeth uh, Wilcox, our lay leader, who comes now to be our scripture reader for today. A reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. A root shall come up from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. 
the spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide the equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist, and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fadling together, and the little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the ass, and the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nations shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Elizabeth. We give thanks to God for you and for your reading today. So the people find themselves in this hopeless situation where they feel cut off from God. They feel like there's nothing they can rely on, no one they can rely on. Isaiah comes. Isaiah says, I, I know right now things look bleak and hopeless, but Isaiah says, someone is, is coming. One is coming whom, whom you can rely on and, and who will teach us that there are more ways that God is work is at work in the world than we realize. And of course, you know, we as Christians, we hear that and we understand that one who is coming to be to be Jesus. Right? And this one who is coming, Isaiah says, will teach us that we can rely on, on so much in the world, even when we think we can't. These gifts from God that God has put all around us. It's what faith is about. We get a little hint of it in, in the third verse, for instance, uh, what Elizabeth just read for us. Uh, the third verse says, his delight, uh, the one who's coming, we understand is Jesus, uh, his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord here doesn't mean, you know, being afraid of someone like, like we're afraid of someone who might be violent or abusive. It, it means more like a sense of awe, right? Like, like when you're standing on the edge of the ocean, right? And the sense of awe standing at the edge of the ocean. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or by what his ears hear. Which is kind of interesting, right? I mean, that's, that's a, that's a, that would be a novel way to, uh, to judge today, right? I'm not going to judge by what I see or by what I hear. Right? Instead, Isaiah says, this one who's coming We'll, we'll realize that there is, is more to the world than just what we can see and hear. And that what it is that we cannot see and hear might just be the most important stuff there is of all. In other words, he's talking about a kind of, a kind of trust in the invisible, right? A, a kind of faith that is a trust in the invisible. Which actually is one of my favorite quotes from Polar Express. The, the conductor at one point tells the boy as he's getting onto the train, he says, it is true that sometimes seeing is believing, uh, but sometimes uh, the most important things in life are the things you can't see. And that's what we see in, in Jesus again and again. In, in Matthew chapter 6, for example, Jesus says, you know, uh, there is this unseen God that cares in unseen ways for the birds and flowers, and you can trust that this unseen God is going to care for you in unseen ways as well. Trust in the invisible. In Matthew 12, uh, Jesus, uh, we are told, can see the, the unseen content of our hearts and our minds and our spirits, right? Trust in the invisible. And then there's that great passage in John 3 where, uh, where, where Jesus says, just as you, you can't see the wind and you can't tell where the wind is coming from and you can't tell where the wind is going, but the wind is there and it's powerful and it's strong and it's real, that's the way it is with the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, trust in the invisible. Now, we might hear that and we might think, well, that's all fine and good for Jesus, right? Jesus can trust in the invisible. Jesus was the savior of the world, after all. Jesus is the son of God. But, you know, it's a little harder for us to trust in the invisible. We're just mere mortals. 
And I hear that. But what I'd like to suggest is that it's actually not hard to trust in the invisible at all. And it's actually really easy. And we do it all the time. I mean, for example, um, let's say uh, right now we all decided that before the hour of worship is up, we're going to have a gigantic Campbell pizza party right here in the sanctuary, right? Which, by the way, is an idea I highly recommend. If any of you want to get working on that, that would be great. But let's say we all decide we're going to have a pizza party before we leave today. How would we go about uh, fulfilling our desire to have a pizza party? Would we all get in our cars? And would we all drive over to the pizza place? And would we say, hello, uh, pizza place person? Because that's how we, you know, we, we talk. And we'd say, hello, pizza place person. Uh, we would like, please, to order some pizzas. And, uh, and we'd say, thank you, because we're a polite church. And then we would give them money because we pay for stuff. And then we would get the pizza. And we, we bring it. Is that what we would do? No, that's not what we would do. You know what we would do? We would pull out our magic boxes, right? We would pull out our magic boxes. And we would use our magic boxes to find out how to talk to the magic box of the pizza place. And then we would say, hello, pizza place person. I would like pizza, please. And do you know what would happen? We would get pizza. How does that happen? Because it sends signals, right, from our magic box to their magic box. Do we see these signals? No, right? These signals are invisible. But do we trust in these invisible signals? You bet we do. We trust in them so much that if the pizza isn't here in 30 minutes, we should get it free, right? Or, or think about when you came in the sanctuary today. Were you worried when you came in the sanctuary today that there would not be enough oxygen to breathe? No, right? Now, can you see that there's enough oxygen or not to breathe? No, but we just trust that there's enough oxygen in here for us to breathe. When we came in today, were we worried that we'd start floating up to the ceiling and go up into the sky? No. Why? Because we trust in this invisible magical thing called gravity that keeps our feet on the ground, right? We trust in invisible things all the time. The invisible things keep us alive. We wouldn't be here without the invisible things. And we know that they're there because of the effects. But not because we can see them or hear them or touch them or feel them. Which brings us to a question. What if faith is not as hard as we think it is? What if faith is not like that little boy in the Polar Express who says, oh, I wish I could believe harder so that I could see Santa Claus, right? What if faith is not some Christian version of that where we say, oh, we just wish we could believe harder. We wish we could get to do a 7.2 on the faith scale so that God would love us and we could go to heaven and all that. What if faith isn't that? What if it's a whole lot easier than that? What if it's just trusting in these invisible realities that are around us all the time, that are a part of us all the time, and that keep us alive, that we may choose in this place to call God? One final example to say, illustrate what I'm talking about here. Um, you know, right now, for all of us in this room, the ocean is invisible, right? None of us in this room right now. We can't see the ocean, hear the ocean, touch the ocean, smell the ocean, feel the ocean. We can't put our feet in the ocean right now. For all practical purposes, the ocean is invisible. Even if we got in our cars and we drove home, unless you drive really, really far away and you live really, really far away, we're not going to experience the ocean in any way, right? Right now, for us, it is just a hypothetical construct, right? We, we may have seen the ocean at some point in our lives. We may not have seen the ocean at some point in our lives. Now, does that mean that the ocean isn't real? No, it's, it's real, right? But it's, it's out there somewhere, and we may never, ever see it or hear it or think it or feel it. And yet, 
And yet, we know it's real. How do we know it's real? Because we, we experience its effects. We, we taste it. We see it in every bottle of water, right? In every glass of water. Whenever we got a cough, we open up the bottle, we drink it, or whatever, right? In anything we drink. Because water is the, you know, the main component of everything that we drink. All of this is evidence of the ocean, right? Every bottle of water you drink, every cup of water you drink, is evidence of the ocean, because it came from the ocean, it will return from the ocean. This is a little piece of the ocean. We don't need evidence to know the ocean is out there. You can just look right here. This is the ocean. This is a piece of it. And, and what, if, what, if, um, what if it's the same way with God, right? If God really is love, as 1 John 4 tells us, if God really is this, this, this endless, infinite ocean of love that is out there somewhere that may seem quite invisible to us, then what if every experience of love you have ever had in your life is like a little cup of water from the ocean? What if it's like a little piece of God? Every time someone has loved you, every time you have loved someone else, what if that's been a little piece of God? And what if we don't need evidence that there is an ocean out there somewhere because we can taste it and see it in our cup? And what if we don't need to, to believe so strongly, to get ourselves to believe so strongly that there's a God out there somewhere because we've experienced love in our lives? And that's a little piece of God right there. That's maybe all the evidence we need, maybe all the evidence we get. But it's enough to know that there's an ocean out there somewhere. And that's what faith is like, I believe, that we find in the Bible. Faith is not trying to convince our brains and convince others that somewhere out there, hundreds of miles away, there's an ocean that is invisible to us. Faith is, is seeing the ocean in every bottle of water in every cup of water. Faith is seeing little pieces of God, all the evidence we need in, in every moment of love being given and received. Trusting in the invisible isn't hard. We do it all the time. It's what keeps us alive. And it's, it's what makes life worth living. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Would come the time in our worship service where we uh, offer our tithes and our gifts to God. And we are so grateful that, that God has given us this church family where we see these glimpses of God. We see glimpses of God's love and glimpses of God's generosity. And so... As we um, continue as an act of worship in response to the message, we have this moment where we can offer from what God has given us back to God and offer it and entrust it to God to use for the sake of the ministries that God has designed us to do. So um, the ushers will come forward and they will pass the offering plates and you can place your offering in there if you haven't already signed up to do that or you can give online. Uh, also know that if you didn't get an opportunity to sign in and let us know you were here today when you entered um, the doors, there are attendance pads at the ends of each pew. So please take that and write your name down, pass it down the pews. There's anybody else in your row. Um, so you can, um, everybody has a chance to sign in and you can also kind of see who's sitting next to you if you don't know them. So again, we are, are grateful to be here together in worship this morning, and we are uh, grateful to Sarah and Bill Ed for this beautiful song that they are offering to the glory of God. When my mind is like a battlefield And my heart is overcome by fear And hope seems like a ship that's lost at sea 
my enemies on every side and i'm tempted to run and hide your gentle whisper reaches out to me peace holds me when i'm broken sweet peace passes understanding when the whole wide world is crashing down i fall to my knees and breathe in your peace whistling the terror of the night sets in but i can feel your angels all around i am resting underneath the shelter of your mighty wings your promises are where my hope is found all my hope Peace holds me when I'm broken, sweet peace that passes understanding. When the whole wide world is crashing down, I fall to my knees and breathe in your peace. I remember who you are. You're the God who's never far. So I will not be afraid. God, you always keep me safe in your arms i remember who you are you're the god who's never far so i will not be afraid god you always you keep me safe you give me peace that holds me when i'm broken sweet peace that passes understanding when the whole wide world is crashing down i fall to my knees and breathe in I breathe, I breathe you in. Take a deep breath and be still and know that you are God. Sarah, that is such a blessing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bill Ed, for accompanying. We are grateful. Well, uh, offering ourselves to God during our, our giving time is one way that we can respond to the movement of the Lord in our lives. There are some other ways as well that I want to share with us in our next steps moment, ways you can get involved here at Campbell. Uh, the next movie we're going to be taking a look at in this series is called The Preacher's Wife. And uh, may not be quite as popular as The Polar Express, but it is a, it's a warm-hearted family film. And we're going to be watching it not this Wednesday, but a week from this Wednesday, on December 14th. Uh, dinner will be at 5.30, 6 o'clock movie. Uh, if you're interested, please sign up in the Fellowship Hall as you leave. We would appreciate that. Again, that's not this Wednesday, but the Wednesday after that.
Uh, we still have some Advent calendars uh, left for you. Uh, one per household, please, in the fellowship hall if you haven't picked one up. You're welcome to as you leave. And just a reminder that our Advent giving is underway, what Joy spoke about earlier, taking up a collection for our family of faith uh, in Monte Cristo, uh, Nicaragua. If you choose to give, please just mark Monte Cristo on the envelope or on your check. Uh, I want to remind us again that next Sunday is a very special Sunday, one of the highlights of the year. Uh, it is, whatever we have, a, a musical Sunday. It is our Advent musical next week, so please come uh, at both services. Uh, we're going to be offering it. You can come to both services, too, if you want to. That would be great for attendance, if you want to. Uh, you can also invite your friends, please, and that because uh, uh, they will enjoy it. I am, I am certain it will be a blessing. We look forward to that. Uh, the week after that, December 18th, we have our Children's Nativity Parade at this service. And then we come to Christmas Eve and Christmas Day weekend. I want to let you know just a little bit about that. Uh, did you know, you probably did, that this year Christmas is on a Sunday? What day is Christmas on this year? Sunday. It's on a Sunday. You're so good. That's excellent. And so that means Christmas Eve is? Saturday. The best congregation at Springfield. That's right. <laughs> Christmas Eve is on a Saturday. Very, very good job. And so what that means is we've got uh, two services for Christmas Eve on Saturday, December 24th, a 4 p.m. family traditional service, a 7 p.m. Uh, modern and band service. So please come to 4, to 7, uh, 4 or 7 uh, on Christmas Eve. And then Sunday morning, since Christmas is a Sunday this year, we're going to be only having one service. It's going to be a 10 o'clock service. It's going to be very casual, very informal. It's not going to be very long. We're not going to have any Sunday school, anything else. Uh, it is called a come as you are uh, service, uh, which is a polite way of saying something that I have had as a personal policy since I have been a pastor from the very beginning, which is that on those years when, on those Sundays, when Christmas falls on a Sunday, it is okay to come to church in your pajamas. So you can come to church in your pajamas if you want to uh, for Christmas morning at 10 a.m. I myself will be in my uh, my Santa onesie with footsies. And so uh, so come. So please don't make me feel like I'm a fool. Come and uh, uh, pajamas are welcome on Christmas morning, 10 a.m., a short service, a fun service, a family service, 10 a.m. Christmas morning. There's one other update I want to share with you, and it relates to uh, the 100 in teams game that we started a couple weeks ago. Do you remember this? Do you remember this for a couple weeks ago? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we were trying to get a uh, hundred people in church to sign up for some of our new kind of leadership administrative teams, right? And, uh, and, and we wanted to get Super Bill to church, right? And this is how we were going to do it. For every 10 people who signed up, uh, we, Super Bill was going to advance one space on the board until he gets eventually to number 10 here at uh, the end, and we got all 10 people signed up. Well, I haven't given you any updates on what has happened. So in the first week and a half after we started doing these updates, after we gave you the challenge to sign up for 100 in teams, in the first week and a half, this is what's happened. So after the first week and a half, he made it to space six, right? And if you may remember, space six is red because if he made it to space six, he was going to get a traveling companion. Do you remember this? And, and you did. So we had 60 people signed up. Super Bill got a traveling companion for the rest of the journey. Please give a round of applause for his traveling companion, Super Rachel. <laughs> right? There's Super Rachel. All right. But that's not all because after Super Rachel joined Super Bill at space number six, when 60 people signed up, they had more journeys to go because we got more cards and this is what's happened since Super Rachel joined them. They're almost there. They're almost there, but they're not quite there. Right? I think last count we had 93 people signed up, right? So we just need seven people to get Super Bill and Super Rachel to church by Christmas, please. So if you have not signed up uh, for one of our uh, teams, kind of organi organizing teams next year on the 100 teams cards. You can find them in the back of the sanctuary. I believe we can get Rachel and Bill to church. And if Rachel and Bill get to church 
uh, by, by Sunday, uh, by, by Christmas there on Faith 10, we're going to celebrate that. But there's another challenge as well, which is, you may remember the week before we started this, that we, it was Stewardship Sunday. We had our pledge cards turned in. We are getting close to having 100 pledge cards turned in as well. So if we get to 10 uh, on the 100 teams and we get 100 pledge cards too, they will be joined by a third traveling companion, a, a, a super member of our staff whom you will know and love and recognize when you see them, uh, but you're not going to see them unless we get 100 pledge cards turned in. We're almost there as well, but if you haven't had a chance, please, for your household to turn in a pledge card, we would appreciate that very much as well. All right, I think that is all the silliness I have for you right now. I invite you please to stand as we are able and to join together in our closing song. The words will be on the screen. Let's sing it out. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Let there be peace on earth, the peace that was meant to be. With God our creation and children are we. Let us walk with each other in perfect harmony. Sing it out one more time. Here we go. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Next week, next week we are having our very special uh, Advent uh, musical cantata. Please come, please bring uh, guests and friends. It will be a joyous and uh, and wonderful time for uh, for all of us. Until then, we want to send you out with a blessing. So let's pray. Oh God, thank you so much for each person here and for these moments together. Send us out this week, O oh Lord, uh, assured of your love and your care, trusting in uh, those invisible forces that bind us together with you and with each other. Fill us with your peace, that we may offer it to the world through Jesus Christ our Lord, in whom we pray. Amen. Amen. We'll see you next week. Remember, God loves you, Christ loves you, and we do too.
Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. How are you all? Good. Good to hear you.